Uh, the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission was created back in 1973, so same time frame as the Endangered Species Act. It was created by Act uh, 112 to establish a system of natural areas. Uh, the responsibilities under this act included acquiring areas containing habitat for rare, vanishing, or endangered species, subspecies, or populations of animals or plants. So the short of it is, the mission of our agency is protecting the state's rare plants, animals, and natural communities. Uh, so around this same time, so the early to mid-1970s, a gentleman by the name of Bob Jenkins of the Nature Conservancy came up with a process to evaluate projects and properties uh, for conservation purposes. And he and his colleagues develop, developed methodology to document the locations of rare uh, plants, animals, and natural communities. And with this data, they used a coarse filter, fine filter method a strategy for protection of biodiversity. So by protecting representative examples of different ecological systems, they have the, the effect of also protecting many of the species that use those ecological systems. However, there are rare species uh, and species that use very local habitats that aren't picked up well by this uh, this coarse filter, and so other strategies, a fine filter is necessary, such as buying land specifically to protect a single species. And from this, this led to the Nature Conservancy slogan of protecting the last of the least and the best of the rest, and I'm sure many of you have, have heard that slogan before. Now the data of locations of the rare species and natural communities is housed in databases within the Natural Heritage Network. And typically the data for a particular state is housed within a state agency. And in Arkansas, it's, it's housed within the Arkansas Heritage Program, which is the research arm of the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. And the various state heritage programs are part of NatureServe, which is an international nonprofit group and within the network, standardized methods are used to collect, uh, compile, analyze, and store data on the rare elements. And this allows uh, planning across regions, and which is important because the species don't recognize political boundaries. So it's important to be able to do a, a broader sense of, uh, of planning. So part of this process is determining what is rare. And this is done by assigning heritage conservation status ranks at the global and state levels. Uh, the, the status ranks are based on a one to five scale with one being critically imperiled and five being common and secure. Uh, the global ranks are assigned by NatureServe and the state ranks are assigned by the various state heritage programs. Although they are, this is done in partnerships with many other people. For example, uh, when we assign state ranks, especially for, for uh, animals, we typically put together a committee. Uh, we assign a, a person that's ahead of the committee, maybe a professor at, uh, at one of the universities, and, and then uh, we will work with them to determine what, what are the species of concern and then assign the status ranks. And these ranks provide an approximation of a species risk of extinction, which is important. And this is a dynamic process, and the ranks can and do change as new information is compiled. So you can imagine back in the, in the 70s and, and 80s, this, this was quite a task, because at that time, none of the species had any ranks. And so there was inventory that was required to do across a really broad range of species. Now we know... You know, there's a lot of species we don't necessarily need to, to inventory as often. You know, blue jays are doing pretty well and so forth. So the data is used to inform conservation decisions. Uh, for example, stewardship activities. You know, you have a certain species, species in an area that maybe has open areas and was adapted to a habitat that was burned frequently. So you need to make sure you burn that area once every two or three years. Or... Conversely, you have a species that does not do well with burning. You need to make sure that you don't have burning in your management plan. 
It's also used for environmental reviews. Uh, we do environment review, environmental reviews in house. Uh, so we're not a regulatory agency, but we do environmental reviews related to uh, re to uh, regulatory agencies, and we also do environmental reviews that are on a volunteer basis. For example, developers often send things in, and they want to make sure they're not about to develop something and get down the road like what happened in the darter that uh, Alan talked about, and find out three quarters of the way down that they can't do that. You know, they need to stop. Or in some cases, people are just trying to do the right thing. They want to make sure that they're not causing damage to a species of concern. And the data is also used to ident identify potential natural areas. It's also been used in eco-regional planning. The Nature Conservancy used the data when they were doing eco-regional planning for the coastal plain, those Ozark Mountains, Washita's, and so forth. We've also used it uh, in a system called hotspot mapping, where you can see clusters of species of concern across the state and then those can be, become focal areas to, uh, for us to put our, our attention to for acquisition efforts or for partnering with other groups to help protect species in those sites. Arkansas Heritage Program assesses the status of species in natural communities and compiles information on the state's rare elements in a centralized database. And this data is used to drive acquisition efforts by by our agency and other groups. And I just want to touch on one other area before we move on. And, you know, so often we talk about endangered species and it's all doom and gloom, but there are success stories out there. And I think it's important that we talk about those to show that we are making progress and that what we're doing does make a difference. And when I say we, I mean the collective we of the different agencies, the non government agencies, and private citizens. And I'm going to kind of cover this by threats and species. And going back to the 60s and 70s that Alan talked about earlier, and uh, one of the problems back then for species was DDT. We had several species that uh, suffered due to that. And one of them, of course, uh, probably our biggest success story is the bald eagle, which is, was a federally endangered species and now has been delisted. Another Fantastic success story was the peregrine falcon. Uh, same thing, DDT caused it to become uh, imperiled, and now it has become delisted. Another species in the same group that didn't become federally listed, but was cooper sock. And now cooper socks are fairly common. They nest in town, uh, even more common in the winter. I, I watch them chasing pigeons from my downtown office uh, quite often. Uh, another threat hunting and persecution and then a species that has recovered fairly well from that is the gray wolf. Uh, another threat, loss of habitat coupled with loss of ecosystem processes, in this case frequent fire, uh, the red cockaded woodpecker. It has not recovered but it is on the road to recovery. Uh, it, for the longest it was either declining or had stable populations and now many of the populations are increasing. Uh, habitat loss and hunting, American alligator and the grizzly bear are both good success stories. And then there are populations that are endangered because they're endemic and just have small population size. And Chris mentioned one of those earlier, uh, the Ozark bigger bat. It's still an endangered species, but it's much better protected now than it was, uh, largely due to, to uh, federal grants that help acquire land in Arkansas and, o and Oklahoma that uh, housed to have caves that support the uh, species and also has habitat where they forage. And of course, everything I mentioned so far are, are animals. And there are also plants, and there, there is kind of a bias when it comes to uh, what's listed as endangered, uh, especially when it comes to plants, but there are other species as well. But for example, there are 30 species or so in the state that are listed, federally listed, and of those five, or, or plants, yet we have approximately 2,700 plant species. 